All right, thanks. And they drop that. And we are recording and we're gonna start it off hopefully with a little bit more positive news from Paul in the COVID situation. Go ahead, Paul. Well, I'm afraid it's not a good bit more positive. Um, it may be slightly more positive in that the state as a whole has now now appears to have turned around for, for the first time in, in many weeks. The number of new cases in the state of Virginia has dropped a little bit. Uh, the um, uh, Num the per capita number, the number of new cases per 100,000 is still 253. Uh, high transmission rate is considered over 100. So it's still very high, but it's better than 291 last week. So uh, the that's about the only bit of good news other than the fact that the Virginia Beach uh, continues to improve. It's dropped several weeks in a row now. Well three weeks anyway, um, the, um, the, the, so it's, it's case rate is 107. So it's, it's not too far from getting down below that high transmission level. Um, the uh, state, however, on the Eastern shore, uh, the, the, the uh, I believe it's true everywhere that the rural, rural uh, curve legs behind the, the, the 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 curve at the in the centers of population, which is why I think the state is beginning is turned around. Virginia Beach is turned around, but the eastern shore, both counties are near their all time uh, near their highs. Um, the uh, Northampton County had dro dropped just a slight bit from last week, but still is the worst one, uh, worst tally we've seen. Uh, since mid-January, if you omit last week, it's down a little from last week. Uh, Cape Charles has equaled its all-time high of 19 new cases. Last week, it was 18 new cases. And Accomack County is, is back up as well. So on the Eastern Shore, we're not doing well. Uh, other parts of the state indicate that things have turned around. And nationally, if you look at the national curve, things have turned around. So I don't think we, we can be too far from this beginning to turn here, but we're not there yet. Um, Paul, I, I happened to look briefly last night at the Virginia Health Department website, and uh, they seem to have a lot of detail going into reinfections, breakthrough infections, details and stuff like that. So I, I don't know if you're looking at that or the CDC site. No, I, I haven't uh, focused on that. Okay, okay. Well, the other thing they showed, <laughs> they showed a general curve of infections within the state of Virginia. And it seems to be following pretty closely like the Spanish flu. There was a peak, then it subsided, then there was a huge peak in the middle, then it subsided, then there was one last peak that was rather small, and then it was gone. So. It actually kind of looks similar to that curve. So um, I, I didn't really get a chance to look at it in any great detail, but um, I, I was just curious whether you were looking at CDC site or the Virginia Health Department no. site. No, I get all my information from the Virginia Department of Health. Okay, all right. I mean, I look at the CDC website from time to time too. Uh, uh, I, look, I, I, I try to use every source I can. But yeah, um, yeah. but the, for the purposes of these reports, I use the Virginia Department of Health. Okay, and then looks like Pfizer's all ready to go for any kind of a booster shot. And the other and Pfizer's fully approved. Uh, I, I called uh, Eastern Shore Rural Health because uh, I got Moderna uh, right. almost eight months ago now, and uh, my second one. And, and I asked them if I could get uh, my Moderna <laughs> another booster. Uh, and they said, no, not till it's fully approved. And they don't really go along with mixing. For example, you got Pfizer, or I'm sorry, you got Moderna to begin with, but they don't really recommend you go ahead with a Pfizer booster. Is that? That's correct. What, what, okay. 
Does anybody else have? Go ahead, Bill Murphy. Yeah, uh, yeah, Paula. I have a couple questions for you. I was doing some reading this morning after I read your report about the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines and whether they were mixable or not. And it, it doesn't seem to be any clear cut recommendation, but everything I read sort of said there was not enough evidence to support that being a wise thing to do. Now, right. you know, having read that, uh, I got the Moderna vaccine previously, both shots, and Mary Jo and I have an appointment next week for the booster. And right. from what I was reading, the only thing they would have would be Pfizer, which I wasn't going to do until I was sure. But I spoke with one of our neighbors um, this morning, him and his wife, uh, got their shots yesterday. They also received Moderna. And according to Ron, uh, he told me that when they went up to get the booster yesterday, they gave them the Moderna vaccine. Huh. Huh. Interesting. Uh, uh, and the other, the other maybe, question I have. Maybe, and, and maybe it depends on who you is, talk to. Uh, well, I, I, like with most things up there, it really does about appointments yeah. and everything else. But the other question I have is when you get this booster, are, are you are adults or people our age, are you getting a, another full dose? That's my understanding. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But so you wouldn't recommend mixing in them, or do you have any feelings about that? I don't. I, I, you know, the, the nice thing about Moderna is it's been shown that really the long-term protection from Moderna is better than the long-term protection from Pfizer. Uh, it, there hasn't been the decrease in the Moderna uh, immunity that as much as they've seen with the Pfizer. Okay. So people okay. that got the Pfizer shots need the booster more than the people that got the Moderna. Yeah. Okay. All right, any other questions or comments for Paul? Okay, well, um, Paul, thank you. And Sage advice, just kind of be on the lookout. Um, we all want this over with, believe and, me. And no actually, I'd, I'd like to get the booster myself, but, but I'd like to get the Moderna booster. I'm going on a trip to Texas in a couple of weeks, and I'd like to get it before I go. Um, the uh, and I'm planning. I've heard of some people going over uh, to Virginia Beach, uh, like the CVSs and such, and getting it. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I may just call them. I yeah. called Riverside this morning, and they won't schedule it yet for a Moderna booster because it hasn't been approved. I guess you call the CVS. No, Riverside Health. Okay, right. All right. Well, I know some what, people got it uh, what, before they go came ahead, with the approval of Pfizer. Go ahead, Joan. Okay, I just wanted to let those of you who have smartphones and, and use them in their smart capacity, there's an app called Common Pass, all one word, that you can download and then give it the inform your key information. It will go to Virginia and download your vaccination status for either the Moderna or the <laughs> Pfizer. And it oh. will, you actually will have it on your on your phone. Cool. I don't know if you can see that or not, oh, probably not. But anyway, um, it's just a nice additional way to show that you've had your vaccinations. And I, I'm hoping someday that Virginia will join um, the electronic version of them, but I know the airlines, I think, do. And it's called okay. Common Pass? The website again. Common, Common Pass, C-O-M-M-O-N-P-A-S-S, -S, all one word. There are a number, there are a couple of ones out there, but this one seemed, when I looked at the number of them, this one seemed to be the best for, for now anyway. So John Burtis, yeah, uh, something. Just for Paul and others to add to the confusion, I had a six plus checkup a week or two ago. And at that time, we scheduled a booster for Moderna for myself and for Sela for late October. I can't tell you the date, I don't remember, 28th, 29th, which is six months after we had our first shot. So, and that's Riverside. So I, you know, we're scheduled to go up to NASA Water to take the shot. So, just for what it's worth, and we're traveling like you, Paul, but not until November. So this would be ideal if it works. And and thank you, Joan, because I've been looking for something like that because it is something that will help us. We travel overseas, we have it on our phone. So right. thank you. 
Kind of what I've been hearing too, it might be about four weeks. This was last week. Uh, might be about four weeks and then Moderna would be uh, available again. Um, Dr. Clark, I, I see you're online. Do, do you have any updates on the Moderna availability? No, they're still discussing that and they haven't come out with any official recommendations yet. So like said, maybe in about four weeks, we'll hear something from the government. Okay, that, that's kind of what I heard as well. Okay. All right, well, that kind of leads to the next thing. And that's the vote on whether to meet in person at the coffee house on October 5th. That's next Tuesday's meeting. Um, if you are in favor of meeting in person next week, October 5th at the coffee house, how about raising your hand for me? One, two, three. Okay, three. So it's gone down since last week. All right, and obviously out of the, see, 15 that are on here, that means that nine, uh, uh, that 12 are not in favor. Okay. All right, well, we'll carry it over and um, hopefully we start seeing some better news. Really, when, <laughs> honestly, I would like to see what some other um, countries are experiencing with this a dramatic fall off, almost like it hits a wall, boom, everything falls off all at once. So I'm hoping for that. Um, we got Bill Stram on here. And last week we talked a little bit about World Polio Day, which is October 24th. And the meeting that we have just before them would be Tuesday, October 19th. And typically what we did um, we, we would have the Purple Pinky Day for donations to the World Polio. Um, hopefully, we can do something for that. If, if nothing else, then maybe set up a table at, at the coffee house, but sitting outside and swing by with your car, drive by, make a donation, and dip your pinky into the purple uh, ink. Um, we, we should really try to do something for, for making donations to World Polio Day. Bill Stram, you want to add anything to that? Not really, uh, Chuck. Um, I mean, the 19th or if we could even do the 26th. So okay. whatever, what everybody agrees with, that, that gives us an extra week. So, and we can, we can post, I mean, we could do it. Um, if we did, if we didn't have our first meeting until the first weekend and first Tuesday in November, that would be fine. Okay, all right. I wasn't sure when they would actually. No, I'm no, sure no. They would no. It's okay. it's 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 mostly it's mostly the thought process and trying to do it as close to World Polio Day. But I mean, these are uh, extenuating circumstances. So let's let's. Let's try to do it when we, uh, we're all together. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah, I would suggest, if, if I may, that we might just tentatively plan for our first meeting on October 26th and uh, plan for that to be uh, Purple Pinky Day. And, all right. you know, if, if our hopes are, are met and, and, the, and the incidence does fall fairly significantly between now and then, then I think a lot more people would feel safe in coming. Okay, I, I think we'll do that. We'll put the stake in the ground for October 26th. And uh, hopefully the week before, um, we see some positive movement towards uh, a diminishing situation with COVID. So, all right, well, I'm gonna write it down and, and Matty, you can kind of put it in the newsletter that we're gonna make the goal October 26th. Um, to to do this meeting um, to address the world polio situation and donations for that. Reggie, uh, Reggie do you have a speaker for the 26? Uh, uh, yes, I have a couple of people I can plug in there, but if you don't want to have a speaker that day, let me know now. No, so no, I, I was going to suggest um, um, 
John Coker is dying to come on in person. Uh, yes, and he's one of the two. <laughs> okay, give give him priority. <laughs> okay, Bill. All right, so um, that kind of leads into the next thing. Reggie is wide open for suggestions for speakers. So if you think of anything, you run across something in the news uh, locally or across the country, get in touch with Reggie, give him your recommendation. Um, if you do have a contact information for whatever that particular item is, let Reggie know that too, an email address and or a phone number, but definitely a person's name if you can. Um, Reggie, any, anything else to add to that? No, no, uh, you covered it well. We welcome suggestions. We've been getting suggestions. We're plugging them into the schedule. Uh, but we still need more so that we can continue to keep the schedule full. But thanks a lot for all okay. those who participated so far. All right. And tomorrow, uh, going down to the project, we're going to we're going to meet over at the uh, Cape Charles Museum, and we're going to do some work on the caboose. Hopefully, um, do some pressure wash on the on the roof and get that done. It's supposed to be a pretty nice day tomorrow, so. Um, We'll look for Bill, Bill Murphy said he would be there a little later. Um, we're going to start around 10, but Bill's got another appointment. He should be there around 11 or so. And we got uh, at least one other person coming as well, Larry Lamont. Um, so hopefully we can, once we get started with the power wash, uh, we can go right across that roof and get it done. Um, Bill Murphy, you have anything to add to that? No, the only thing I would, would add, Chuck, is that <clears throat> we might need more than 20 feet of hose. I know you said you had a hose, but we might need a little more than that. Looking at where the where I think the out, water outlet is at the back of the museum, it's probably more like 50 feet or, or more. Yeah, Larry said he had a hose. He didn't say how long it was, so but okay. um, he mentioned something about he would be bringing a hose, but he would appreciate somebody else bringing some too. So I'm going to bring a I have a 25 footer, I'll bring that. Bill, if you have one, feel free to bring it. I'll see if I can order better that. than less. Yeah. Do you need to go for um, I for you? If you want to come out, that would be great, Matty. Um, if for nothing else, we may need a gopher, who knows? But just to kind of stand down there and watch what we're doing, if somebody Hopefully never, but if somebody should get hurt or something like that, and we need somebody to jump on the phone real quick okay. and dial 911 or whatever, you know, that 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 would be a big help too. So I'll try and be there. Okay. Some... We're going to get there around 10 o'clock in the morning. All right. And uh, Bob, do we have any updates on the fire hydrants? Bob Church. Muted, Bob. Yeah, we. I got one update. To get. I talked to the um, chief, and uh, he wasn't available. But then I talked to the other guy who was next to the chief. He said that he would order the paint. The chief told me he would order the paint about a month or so ago, and and something happened. I don't know what happened, but the guy that I talked to last week, he said he would order the paint. So I'm taking for his word that the paint should be coming in soon. I'll let you know when it comes in. Okay. And Bill, any updates on the Marianne Smith, Marianne Smith School project? No, no, we're we're on track um, for the Boys and Girls Club to uh, start up uh, in a week or so. Um, and a positive thing, I was at a meeting uh, last Friday and met the county administrator for Accomac, and I think um, he's going to help us get wideband hi-fi to Mary Ann Smith free of charge. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna pursue that with him. Uh, very supportive uh, guy, his name is Mike Mason. Maybe some of you know him. He's uh, the equivalent of Charles Kulikowski. Uh, so um, that's the latest from that, that space. 
Last week, you mentioned some sweat equity work that may be coming up. Is that more interior type work? Or yeah, that, that would be inside, and that could take us into the colder weather. But yeah. um, right now, um, let's just stand by. Okay. All right. Well, that's what I was curious about, because if it is interior work, that we can do that all winter long. Yeah. Okay. Um. The basket raffle, I've been seeing your communications on that, Matty, and uh, looks like we're zooming right along as far as uh, getting everything ready online for people to order tickets. The baskets are all ready, and I'll let you go ahead and speak to that. Well, yeah, the website is up and running, and you can go to the website of, uh, and I, I posted the website, I forgot exactly what it is, but if you if you google count me in raffle you can be led to the website or the eastern the eastern shore public library raffle you can get into the website and and the rotary basket is is number 7 apparently and you can choose the rotary basket if you if you like to to the contents of the basket I forget how many total baskets was it? It was a lot. 17 baskets worth over $5,000, I believe. And, and, and the baskets may range in, in the cost of the contents from 150 minimum to, to our basket, which is $940. Wow, that's great. Um, anyone, anyone else want to add anything to that? Yeah, Mehdi, did you get the uh, thank you letter? from the library yeah yeah good good and uh we got john burris here you got any updates on ymca no sir not today okay hey hey and john i need the name of, of the guy that knows about the rental housing it, it's not a guy it would be the town the treasurer for the town of cape charles no no, no i'm the the guy from the y I'll get back. I'll get. I'll get to you. Okay. All right. And we have about five people on screen here. I believe they're all part of the invisible history um, effort. So I'm going to let let any or all of you speak to that right now. Who wants to go first? I'll go first because go I'm the biggest screw up. Um, <laughs> we uh, Tom Godwin was interviewed by me today. And the uh, interview is on Zoom, but I did more things wrong than I did right. Uh, Mehdi has written an 18-page critique of my performance. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, somebody had to go first. <laughs> yeah. To set the bad example, right? <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't have been worse, but... but, uh, <laughs> but but it's a value if you just want to tune in on it. Um, but I, it seems I've missed some of the key things that the smarter people uh, have surrounded this exercise with. But, you know, we have others to do. Well, yes. yes and it could have been worse, Bill. You could have forgotten to hit record. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. <laughs> you might have wished he did. I, I was so focused yeah. on that that I... I, some of that stuff I never heard about, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> it's you know this is a this is a process. You continuously yeah. improve on it process because then we we know what we missed and we can pay attention to that next time. Yeah, but I missed everything, so it's pretty easy. <laughs> Reggie, you want to speak to any part of it? Well, like. Like uh, we, like Bill said, we started the interview and and we are ironing out the kinks so that it will be smooth uh, for the subsequent interviews. Right. And one thing that I learned is that the Zoom account of the Rotary has limited storage, so we need to make sure that I do not schedule on a Tuesday when we are having the meeting. Well, well, that I don't I don't record that to cloud. I, I put that on my computer. But yes. but but get 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 no no I, I did I did that one to cloud Paul. Oh, okay. But, but the meeting I record on my computer. 
Um, Paul, why don't you just let Medi buy some more cloud space? Oh, no, we can't afford that. You have to move up to the next level, which is oh. much <laughs> God, we just raised $15,000 on the uh, cart. You think we uh, could reinvest some of that? Get okay, that's for a board meeting. Gotta manage Sorry. that responsibly. Okay, Paul. Thank you. <laughs> Bill Murphy, go ahead. Yeah, Chuck, I, I just want to thank Bill Payne for setting such a low bar for these interviews. <laughs> <laughs> because up until I just heard that, I was convinced that, that I was going to be the dullest knife in the drawer. I might be able to do a little better now. So thank, <laughs> thank you, Bill. In we your always, sleep, you can do it better, Bill. <laughs> we can always I'll count have a happy on Bill. dollar for that, too. <laughs> we can always count on Bill. <laughs> Actually, since we're talking about Bill, we're roasting him, right, Bill Payne. Uh, he, he called me the other day when we were talking about something, and, and he said, by the way, I'd like to get with you so that we can go over the setup for this interview. And, and then he said later on in the conversation, you know what? I probably don't need it. You know, I could just do it myself. So he did it himself. <laughs> and I did. And I did. <laughs> he did. <laughs> Diane, hey guys, do you have I, anything? I would never be the one to pick on Bill. However, <laughs> <laughs> we were in we were in a meeting last week, and and I called him about something, and he was telling me where the meeting was, and he was sitting outside the door of the meeting. He was at the wrong place. Uh, so, and I called him. He'd been sitting there by himself for a couple hours. But when he showed up. He was a good contributor. So I, I've done that too. So I don't feel so bad about it now. But you're right. <laughs> Bill I owe you one for that, John. You, you saved know, my day. But, Pain, pain, pain always gets something we can we can rise above. He sets a very low bar. You're right about that. <laughs> well, my and, comment is I can't wait to watch this recording. Oh, yeah. You love you love the recording, um, but but it's probably useless. Well, I have full confidence in uh, working out the kinks, and and this thing's just gonna kind of go. Uh, rocket to the top to the once it gets out into the public space so uh good to hear good to hear actually it's good to hear that so many people are involved in this mm -hmm. and uh moving it ahead so thank you all for for your efforts in this and we all learn from our mistakes so no big deal um okay and of course same old story we're looking for an awards committee chairperson and we need a volunteer for the highway cleanups. Um, we're getting down towards the end of the year. We probably can't go past too much past November um, in the next highway cleanup. So even if we get a person step up for just this next one, uh, we'll take that. Um, Bill, I wanted to let you speak a little bit about the upcoming candidate forums that we're gonna sponsor. Yeah, uh, Joan Natale and I have been working together on that. And um, first, the the uh, announcement was made today that the uh, Eastern Shore Chamber of Commerce will do a live announcement down at the uh, KOA, that's the campground place, uh, for all of the Eastern Shore candidates, with the exception of the town council candidates. So Joan and I um, recommend that we limit our focus to the town council. Yeah. Uh, the the um, supervisor candidates that we had invited, uh, they accept it reluctantly, but there's no need for them to do it twice. Um, so we'll focus on the, the uh, town council. We hope to have it at the civic center uh, we'll know uh, by late this afternoon or tomorrow if we can have it at the Civic Center, and then we can have a hybrid um, Zoom um, live approach. A little concerned about people calling in questions live or, or presenting questions to the candidates live because you know, things could go a little crazy. It's after the cocktail hour. God knows what will happen. So um, 
Joan and I are moving ahead and, and we picked the date. The date will be um, the Tuesday before, that's October 26th. It's our um, first meeting in person. Yeah, that yeah. could be a good in-person day. Yeah. Uh, starting at six o'clock. So more to come, we've, we've got time on our side. Wayne Bell has agreed to be our moderator. Um, Bill Murphy has volunteered to work on the moving the chairs around and that sort of thing. So um, I think we're in good shape. Now, the the electronic part of that meeting, was that going to be on Facebook or YouTube or Zoom? or? Well, Zoom, uh, Bill Stram had suggested Facebook to, mm -hmm. uh, to allow people to, you know, talk to the candidates. But we, we, you missed the vetting opportunity there to yes. uh, eliminate duplicate questions or inappropriate questions. Uh, right. So Joan, Joan and I, when we're, we'll get up with Libby, who's been on out of the office since the last, last few days. Week. So uh, we'll get up with Libby and we'll figure it out. You okay. guys will be, you know, you don't have to worry on this one because I'm teamed up with Joan, who makes <laughs> no mistakes. That's and right. I'm teamed so, up with Bill, who also makes no mistakes. I was okay. gonna say, Joan will make you look good, Bill. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for, I'm <laughs> hoping, I'm hoping, I'm counting on it. <laughs> okay, um, just reminder, call us to your buddies and others. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't hurt to pick up the phone and call somebody else who's not on your buddy list, but who is your buddy. So uh, make those calls, invite friends and neighbors, especially new ones moving into the area down here. We've got a lot of new building going on, meeting new people. So uh, we will set up sometime before the end of this year, hopefully sometime in October, uh, maybe a couple hours, set up a booth over in Strawberry Plaza or down at Food Lion and, and just hand out some brochures and and talk to people walking by about the Rotary Club, especially if they live in the area. Um, but guess what we're about to do, Bill? Let's see if you can guess. Did I guess right? Happy dollars, you sure did. I'm proud of you, Bill. Okay, who's got some happy dollars this week? Go ahead, Bill Murphy. Well, I got I've got three actually. I'll do the easy ones first. I got two two happy dollars for for Bill Payne's comment. He made me feel a whole lot better about my possible role in these interviews. <laughs> uh, so that's my first one. My uh, second two happy dollars is it uh, good to see my friend and neighbor Walter. So I wanted to say hi to him. And also Walter, if you would pass it on to Randy that that Mary Jo has not killed her plant yet, and uh, we'll be sending <laughs> proof of life here soon. Okay. All right. And. Uh, now, uh, so that, let's see, that's four. So just make it an, an even 10. So the six will be for, uh, it's a combination happy, unhappy dollar. I was going to do this last week, but uh, I couldn't make the, I forget, John, were you not there? Or I wasn't there last week, one of us, but I think it was me. You were absent, I believe. Yeah. But uh, anyway, uh, as you know, John, and I made kind of a little friendly wager and uh, for the West Virginia, Virginia Tech football <laughs> game. And somehow, uh, Virginia Tech managed to find a way to lose that game. They reminded me so much of their Washington Redskins. But anyway, they lost. And so I've got five happy dollars in John's honor. Uh, and apparently we he seems to remember another larger bet we made. But I've got to go back and review the tape on that one, John. To see, I, I thought it was I thought I had Virginia Tech in eight, but maybe not. I don't know. I will, uh, We'll have to check it. But anyway, congratulations. It's a lot of fun. And and, and I think next year, if, if the two of them play again, we're going to have to come up with something maybe a little more creative that uh, we might be able to do something for the foundation or polio plush or something tied to that. So we'll be keeping an eye on that. All right. I, I, if I can, Chuck, I'll go ahead. Now, I'm, I'm going to use my $6 to buy a, a used West Virginia shirt in Murphy's size. I don't have one that'll fit him because we... We promised we would wear each other's shirts. I could wear his. It might wear be like a dress, but I don't think he can fit mine. So two XL, John. Two XL. Okay, I'll keep that. Two XL, and I've got plenty of tech shirts, so no problem. I figured that. I figured that. Uh, we. Uh, I, I wanted. 
ten dollars for a, a nice weekend in West Virginia. I even stopped in Charlottesville to visit granddaughter and had a good visit there. So lots of ground covered. Sheila had a a birthday weekend and this twenty five year celebration of tamarack. And I got home to have baklava in my refrigerator from my neighbor. So what could be better than that? So that's ten dollars. Do you know how to spell that? I do. Baklava. Mm -hmm. I can hardly say it. <laughs> <laughs> I know how to eat it too. I've been doing yeah. really well. I, I <laughs> okay. Yes. Any more happy dollars? Bill Payne. Bill Payne, you're I was on waiting mute. for somebody to say, Bill, you're on mute. <laughs> I was just getting ready to do it. Well, I'm happy $5 worth because look who's joining the meeting and causing feedback and, and all that. But Jackie just got in from yeah. a Aaron, and I'm happy she's joined me and you guys and ladies. I don't see. I was kind of wondering what happened to her, so I'm glad she's joined too. Hi, Jackie. Hi, everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, um, Reggie. Uh, yes, yeah, so I had five happy dollars. Uh, my wife's sister and her husband came down to visit with us this weekend. Really, the first company that we've had that were multiple day overnight type of company since the <laughs> pandemic, because they are very, very careful. They have a, a new granddaughter, uh, so they're extra careful. And uh, so we, but that was a fun two days and uh, five dollars for that. Okay. Um, I'll jump in with $5 on my own. Uh, this past weekend, I went back up to Northern Virginia, Fairfax County, Loudoun County area, and met up with some former co-workers and friends up there. And we took a bike ride uh, on the WNOD path, which was my usual path that I took a ride on. It's a nice day on Saturday. We had a lunch afterwards in Leesburg. And uh, it, was, it was real nice to see old friends. And um, kind of missed them. So it, it, what I didn't miss was the horrible traffic. I, I made the mistake of believing Google, <clears throat> Google Maps. It said, if you go across the Bay Bridge Tunnel and take 64 and 95 and 495, you'll be there in four hours and two minutes. It was over five hours um, because of traffic and construction. So I decided to go back a different way around the top end of the beltway and 50 and across the Bay Bridge and then down 13 from Salisbury. Still Saturday, it was a nightmare on 495 and even parts of 50 were just brutal. So um, I don't miss any of that. And it seems a whole lot worse than when I lived up there these days. So $5 for that. Hey Chuck, I, got, yeah. I have to add one, right? The, the more, Probably I should have done this one first. Our youngest great grandson turned four a few days ago. All right. And uh, five dollars for that. That was a special event. Yeah, absolutely. Happy birthday to him. What's his name? Name is Maxwell. Okay. Any other happy dollars? So Reggie, Sorry. is that ten for you? Ten for Reggie. Ten all, all together. Yeah, I, I thought I would confuse you there, Pauls. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it is. <laughs> yes, um, it is. Brandy, I have yeah, five Brandy. happy dollars uh, okay, for ahead, my man. own daughter that she enjoys the school so much these days. Um, and also she had a, a, like two, I think two weeks ago when I took her to the New Ruth Garden, she was there by herself. And then guess what? John Buddha's grandson, William was there. Mm. And the, Audrey and uh, William, they had a great time there. And uh, I thought William was a baby, but he got so big. He is so talkative and he was so curious about everything. And then people volunteer there think he's the smartest little guy ever. <laughs> so. <laughs> How old, what grade is your daughter in now, Mary? My daughter is in the second grade because her birthday is in November. If her birthday was in August or September, she would have been in the um, uh, third, third grade. grade. But yeah. she, so she's kind of like the, old, I think, the older one in her class. But she, she really loves um, 
her teachers and her classmates and all the kids. And I think that makes me happy that she loves just school life in general. Yeah. Good for her. Like I told you earlier, I'm glad to hear kids are anxious to get back to school. Right. That never happened when I was going to school. <laughs> we always look forward to the next snow day when we didn't have to go to school. Um, Randy, you had your hand up. Yeah, I have uh, five happy dollars as we speak, I hope. My uh, daughter and my son-in-law are in the air on their way back here from Switzerland, getting ready for my granddaughter's wedding. I'm starting to queue up my happy dollars for the meeting after the wedding, because that's going to have to be a big happy doll. I'll be so glad the darn thing is uh, behind us. So that's, that's where we stand right now. Yeah, she's on her way. Okay. okay. Any more happy dollars? All right. Um, Stan, um, good to see you, by the way. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. I'm out in uh, Virginia Beach. I was going to say, it looks like you're on your phone. Yes, I am. Okay. And uh, today, we have one of our newer members, but he's been around for a little bit of time now, and Al Paschal. And uh, he lives here in Bay Creek, Cape Charles. And we're going to allow Al to dazzle us with his, uh, with his bio. And uh, there's a lot of neat stuff in there. A little bit I know about, Al. It's pretty cool stuff. So, Al, take it away, my friend. All right. I don't know about dazzling anybody. If anybody dozes <laughs> off or needs to go get a sandwich because I'm putting you to sleep, I'll totally understand. <laughs> uh, so, let's see. Bill convinced me to join Rotary because he kept bumping into me and saying, hey, you know, you should come to uh, the coffee house on Tuesdays. And I said, I work. He says... They got to take a lunch break. So over and over and over again. So first of all, Bill's persistence is, is, is what kind of pulled me in here. Hopefully I can have that rub off on me a little bit. All right. So here's my, my bio. I thought I'd start off with something to try and make it at least a little interesting. You know the game, Two Truths and a Lie? So we'll, we'll do that. If you don't know the game, I'm going to say three statements about myself. One of them's a lie. When I'm done saying the three statements, you tell me which one you think is the lie. So here we go. Statement number one, I was continuously employed either full or part time since I was 13 years old. That's statement number one. Number two, I was an FBI informant. Statement number three, I was stuck in an elevator and had to spend the night at the Library of Congress in the rare books collection. So those are my three statements. And you guys get to tell me, hold up your fingers, which one you think is a lie. All right. <laughs> Everybody say, I got some twos, I got some threes, I got a one, okay. All right, so if you guess number one, well, you're wrong. I've been continuously employed either full or part-time since I was 13. I think I should be a billionaire right now, but I don't know where that money went. <laughs> Truthfully. Uh, statement number two, I was an FBI informant. That's actually a true statement. And I can kind of get into that a little further once I get into my job history. And statement number three, that's the false one. I actually didn't spend the night in the elevator or the rare books collection of the Library of Congress. I, a security guard heard me yelling at about eight o'clock at night and got me out. <laughs> so, that's the... That's, that's my story. I mean, those are my two truths and a lie. Um, so as I said, well, let me just start. Uh, I was raised in Norristown, Pennsylvania. For anybody that knows, that's a, about 20 minutes west of Philadelphia by way of the Schuylkill Expressway, unless it's rush hour. Then it's a day and a half west of Philadelphia. <laughs> uh, I grew up in Norristown, Pennsylvania, home, uh, birthplace of people like Tommy Lasorda, Peter Boyle, the actor from Norristown, Mike Piazza, the New York Mets uh, player, and Jaco Pastorius, the jazz musician, all came from Norristown. And Joe and Carmela Pascal from Norristown, descendants of Italian immigrants from Avellino and Montella. They had six kids. I'm number three of six kids. I mean, uh, yeah, my brother Bob, some of you know he's been a physician down here for 
I don't know, almost 30 years. My pop lives up the road in Machapongo for about 20, 25 years. Uh, I'm number three of six, which means I have about a third less pictures in the family album than my oldest brother. And my youngest sibling, I don't think the FBI could find him. He's so obscure. There's no pictures of him in a family album. Any of you from a big family, you kind of can, can maybe relate. Um, so I went to St. Titus Elementary School for eight years, first through eighth grade. After I got out, the archdiocese shut down the school. Then I went to Bishop Kenrick High School in Norristown, Pennsylvania, for ninth through 12th grade. After I got out of there, the archdiocese shut down that school. <laughs> so I'm 0-2 at the archdiocese of Philadelphia <clears throat> at this point. So I figure I'm going to go to Penn State. And I figure the Pope can't even shut down Penn State. Went to Penn State. The idea was to study biology, wildlife ecology. I was going to be a forest ranger. That was my goal. I was going to be a forest ranger. Except organic chemistry kept getting in the way. So eh, that didn't work out so well. The good news is, as I said, in one of my many, many jobs in my lifetime, I got to work with the librarian at Penn State as my work study program job. I'll try and keep the story brief and to the point, but basically I said, okay, what do I do? And she pointed to this big card catalog. Anybody knows that old library card catalogs, rows and rows of shelves of drawers with three by five index cards that have the, you know, the document information, the bibliographic information. She says, start at the top left-hand side, Work your way top left to bottom right. I want you to flip through each of the cards. Every time you find a card that looks unreadable, torn, tattered, or whatever, mark your place, Take the mark the card's place in the catalog, take the card over to that IBM Selectric typewriter and retype the card. Remember, this is 1976, 77-ish, right? And she said, oh, and in addition to that, Every once in a while, the faculty will give us references to bibliographic references to journal articles or books that they need. Go find the articles, photocopy them, and bring them here and put them in the stack. So I tell you that little story because that's going to come into play a little later. Uh, so anyway, that was kind of a tedious work study program. But I'm, the librarian said something to me at that point, 1976-ish, that kind of stuck with me. And she said, you know, all of this is going to change in the next 15 or 20 years. So you watch and see. So that kind of went in one ear and out the other of a, you know, a 20 something. I, I, I didn't think twice about it, but it kind of stuck in there. Uh, anyway, so that was kind of my education as far as that goes. And subsequent to that, I've been kind of interested in computer science. So I took lots of courses at George Mason University and Northern Virginia Community College, et cetera, et cetera, and got uh, micro, the uh, MCSD certification and a Microsoft database administrator uh, certification. I am the dad of three kids. Uh, I have two kids by my first marriage and one child uh, with my lovely wife, Laurie. Some of you have met her. Our oldest daughter is Robin. She lives out in California, Northern California. She's an early intervention specialist, works with kids with special needs in Humboldt County in uh, Northern California. Uh, our second son, I mean, our, our oldest son, second child is Tony, who's uh, in the Navy stationed across the bay in uh, Little Creek Naval Station. He married a beautiful nurse woman named Melissa. We have three grandsons, three grandchildren, all boys. Tony and Melissa have three kids. They're, they're, you've probably heard me talk about them. And uh, he's about to be deployed again in January. He'll be gone for about nine months. And our grandchildren are, this is the part where I'm, I get to be an obnoxious parent and talk about his kids and his grandkids all the time. So bear with me. Our oldest grandson is Owen. He's going to be five soon. Our Middle grandson is Emmett. He just turned three. And our youngest is Eli, who's about, uh, what, six months old now or approaching six months old. So they're over in uh, uh, Virginia Beach area. And he's a U.S. Navy SEAL. So he gets deployed for about nine months at a time. 
And uh, our youngest is Alex, Laurie and I's son, Alex. Some of you know him. He used to work at the Bay Creek Beach Club and uh, Busky Cider. And he is the true definition of a struggling artist living in Philadelphia, trying to make things work as a graphic artist in Philadelphia. So he's, and he's, he's putting his best foot forward and trying to do his best work. Uh, anyway, so that, and of course, those of you who don't know Laurie, Laurie's my wife and uh, we've been married 28 years now. And I think some of you may have met her at our in-person event that we had at the gazebo a couple of weeks back. Um, let's see, so let's start with continuously employed. So I have done all kinds of jobs since I was a kid, newspaper delivery, lawn mowers, painting houses. I worked in a greenhouse for years, plumbing. I built a complete irrigation system for a greenhouse. Uh, I've been a grocery store, worked in stocking shelves in a grocery store. I've worked construction. Um, I worked in a warehouse or paper mill just outside of Philadelphia, a little town called Myquan, if you know the area. It's since been shut down. It was the scariest place I ever, ever, ever worked in my life. If, if anybody's done like factory work and remember, in, in the 1970s, OSHA maybe didn't have the muscle that it has now, but man, that was a scary, scary job. And I realized then, yeah, I don't wanna do factory work. Um, and I worked as a merry-go-round operator in an amusement pier in Wildwood, New Jersey. So I've done a lot of different things. Uh, the wild, the, after high school, I decided I'm gonna go to work at the shore and I worked at an amusement pier. And it was one of those jobs where I was trying to be, you know, efficient and on top of my game. And I went to them and I said, okay, I got a summer job before I go to college. And they said, okay, you're gonna work the merry-go-round. I worked there for a week, collecting tickets and putting kids on this antique carousel that was built in the 1800s and giving them rides and so forth. At the end of the week, I, this big heavy set guy with a white shirt on and greased back hair comes out. And I, I says to him, you know, I never filled out my W-2 forms or anything. I said, I don't, you know, I, I never filled out any paperwork. And he says, he pulls out a wad of hundred dollar bills big enough to choke a camel. And he starts peeling off hundred dollar bills and gave me a couple of them. He says, here, kid, good work. Don't worry about the paperwork. Just come back next week. So that was like Vinny Two Fingers Bonoza that basically was an all cash enterprise and in New Jersey. And the merry-go-round where I operated was basically right outside the office door and lots of shady characters going in and out of the office all the time in an all cash business. So you guys draw your own conclusions on that one. Uh, anyway, eventually I got a call from my cousin who basically said, hey, we're starting up a business here in Arlington, Virginia. And we'd like you to come down and take a look at the business. So he showed us, I went down to Washington. I lived in Philadelphia, went down to Washington DC. He says, here's the plan. He's an engineer and he designed ships for the Navy. And he says, all the time I need these engineering documents and I can't find what I need. And I go to my co company library and the librarian says, well, we don't have that journal article you need. So fill out this interlibrary loan form. Anybody familiar with the old interlibrary loan system and libraries? Okay, you may know all this. You fill out this paper form and she sends it out to a consortium of libraries that work, that work with this company library. And sooner or later, six, eight weeks later, you might get a photocopy of a journal or the book you want. He says, the business plan is this. We know graduate students all over the country are in these big libraries. And we set up a network of really hungry graduate students who would basically photocopy articles for us and provide them to us for a small fee. And we would provide them to corporate R&D libraries. So this was my first venture. Well, actually this was not my first venture. I had started two other businesses prior to this. So I, I kind of was around starting small businesses or working for small businesses for a while. 
the first small business I started was with a, a partner who we sold uh, industrial and residential cleaning equipment. Uh, and that was up in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Anyway, so this fellow, now remember, get back to the library story I told you earlier, where the librarian said, all this is going to change, right? So my cousin says, here's what we're going to do. And we set up this network of graduate students in places like Stanford University Library, Library of uh, the uh, UCLA Libraries, University of Maryland, McKeldin Library and Engineering Library, anybody in those University of Maryland. We had about 18 in key locations throughout the country. Plus we were in Arlington, Virginia. We were surrounded by some of the best information sources and document sources in the world. The Library of Congress, hence that's where I got stuck in the elevator in, in a book collection. Uh, in the, the government printing office, we were literally in the backyard of the government printing office, US government printing office. So that was our, our, our business model. And it seemed to work well for 12 years. We grew the business, but as we were growing the business, remember this is about the time that uh, the World Wide Web hadn't even been mentioned yet. The internet was new, relatively new. This is late, this is early mid eighties. So we, I say we, he had the vision that said, you know, if we digitize all this information and deliver it electronically, this is gonna be really a, a good thing. We hooked up with a fellow named Roger Summit at Lockheed Corporation. Roger Summit had developed a system on an IBM mainframe where he basically took huge amounts of bibliographic information from sources like the engineering index and chemical abstracts. And he digitized, he, I say he, his team, basically built what is considered now really the basic the first search engine. We hooked up with him and we basically leased time on the mainframe. So we provided research services. Companies would come to us and we would basically uh, sell them research services. They'd come to say, I'm doing research on uh, adjuvant cytotoxic chemotherapy. And we'd log into the National Library of Medicine's uh, information and look up bibliographic references to that kind of information. And then our document delivery team would go out and retrieve the articles and send it to them. We were at least 15 times faster than your standard interlibrary loan service where you would fill out a paper form and mail it out and so forth. About the same time that that happened, we hooked up with the, uh, the company MCI started something called MCI Mail, which is the precursor to modern day email. And when we partnered with MCI Mail, our clients who now included pharmaceutical companies, petrochemical companies, engineering firms and law firms could electronically send us their requests for documents and information. So, that's kind of my foray. Oh, and just to complete the story, because I was in Washington, DC, we were based out of Arlington. I would constantly go down to the Library of Congress and make photocopies of journal articles, scientific, technical journal articles, whatever, legal articles, whatever. And one day I said to the librarian, I said, look, if I could just go into the stacks, I got to get this book out of the technical reports collection of the stacks. And restriction, we were, there were restrictions to who could go into the stacks, but she said, eh, okay, no problem. I'll let you in. And I didn't even have to bribe her or anything. Anyway, I go in, it's late in the afternoon and I go up and then the stacks, remember this is not where the public walks. This is like behind the wall where the elevator shaft is. I go up, I'm halfway up in the stacks and the elevator stops. And it's this little tiny elevator that's barely elbow wide. And so I got stuck in the elevator and I'm there and I'm hollering and it's screaming. I'm trying to yell, hey, 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 hey. So luckily somebody heard me and they were able to get me out by about 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. Anyway, that was that, that whole story. The other piece I wanted to get to was I was actually an FBI informant. And during the 80s, you remember the Soviet Union still existed. And we were in the information delivery business. 
One day we were approached by a fellow, uh, Nikolai Avkodashkin, who presented himself as a consulate officer for the Soviet embassy and gave me a list of documents and books that he would like me to retrieve. And I looked at the list and I said, okay, that'd be great. Uh, we'll see what we can do for you. Come back, we'll call you. We'll call you when we're ready, you know, when we've got your list of books ready for you, your list of documents or photocopies of journal articles and such. And he says, okay, fine. And I said, now, do you want to set up an account? And here's another guy, pulls out a wad of $100 bills and gave us 500 bucks and said, here, set up my deposit account in his best English, broken English accent. Not 10 minutes after he left the door, two FBI agents came into the office and said, hey, we understand that you were just visited by this fellow, Nikolai Avgodashkin. And I said, yeah. He says, well, he's a Soviet intelligence officer and you're required to, you know, keep us informed of his, his, uh, his operation. I said, well, are we allowed to do business with him? He says, we'd like you to do business with him. And we'd like you to tell us exactly what he orders from you, what he requests for you to do and what documents he wants you to get. So that's how I technically, they gave us some paperwork, some legal paperwork that we filled out for the FBI. And that was technically an FBI informant for about four years. And uh, that's that's kind of that was kind of an interesting thing. I never really thought it so it's so never really realized that that because most of the people that request documentation from us were people that requested, you know, scientific and technical journal articles about medicine, about engineering, some legal documents and a lot of government documents from the government printing office. So anyway, in 100 words or less, while all of that was going on the internet was being developed, the internet that you and I know today. And that librarian's voice kept coming back to us. So we decided, hey, we better get on top of this because the days of physical hard copy document delivery are gonna go away pretty soon. So we took, and I say we, I took an awful lot of courses at George Mason University, Northern Virginia Community College, uh, George Washington University, got my uh, MCSD certification to be a solution developer and a database administrator. And we started offering the service to automate corporate libraries. We've automated libraries at the US Geologic Survey. They had a specialized collection. Uh, we basically indexed and abstracted the documents. You know, those little card catalogs? Yeah, we, we digitized all of that. We uh, created a, a, some software interface so that users could use a good search, a, a relatively easy search mechanism to search and retrieve information. And that is really kind of what led me to start we, uh, building databases. Since that time, the company that my cousin and I worked uh, built up, where he sold it to one of our competitors. I worked for the competitor for a while. And subsequent to that, I went to work for the department, uh, a contractor for the Department of Education, built some databases and that data warehouse for the Department of Education. And uh, the, the organization was the Council for Exceptional Children. Subsequent to that, I went to work in building databases in the healthcare industry. And uh, for 20, almost 20 years now, I've been in the healthcare uh, namespace, basically building uh, databases related to healthcare receivables management, basically managing software that manages hospital business offices, not the medical end of thing, but basically the business office end of things. And that's pretty much what I do today uh, for almost, I don't know, 20 years now. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. I know we're a little bit over one o'clock, so and the only other thing that I'm going to add is, and I had to get this plug in. Since my mid or late 30s, I started swimming and and I've been swimming and I took up open water swimming and I got involved with the Navy SEAL Foundation about eight years ago when I participated in one of their open water swimming events to raise money for the Navy SEAL Foundation. It's kind of personal for me. Our son is a Navy SEAL. He's getting deployed in January. This will be his like fifth deployment at this point. 
He's leaving three kids at home. Anyway, the SEAL Foundation supports families like him and the families of those who were, or have been injured or killed while serving. And they leave behind some you know, serious issues that need to get taken care of. So if I could just do this one thing and then I promise I'll give the screen back if, if I can do it. Well, never mind. If anyone's interested in learning more about how they can support the swim. Wait, wait a minute, uh, Al. Maybe I have to uh, let go. I have to um, give you authority. And I'm sorry, I didn't anticipate. Okay, it's on. You should be able to do it now. Oh, okay. Hang on for a second. I'll get you there. Otherwise, send me the document and I'll send it to everybody. Oh, there it is. You're on. Yeah, we got it. Okay. And again, I don't know how appropriate or not this is, but I had to get my plug in for if you're interested in supporting the Navy SEAL Foundation and this particular swim event, you can go to impact.navysealfoundation.org slash support the swim. And you can feel free to if you feel moved to make a donation it's a really good uh organization and it's a really good cause that i've been involved with since uh, i guess eight years now and hey, uh, one thing i noticed in that picture is uh the guy swimming obviously but all the ones in the kayaks are dressed in heavy coats and and winter hats <laughs> was that yeah. a cold day yeah that when I that was me swimming in the foreground, and that was uh, that was like 58 degree water, Oof. and it's a three and a half mile swim if you can swim in a straight line. The problem is I don't swim too straight, so <laughs> I get closer to four miles because I can't swim in a straight line <laughs> to save my life. But yeah, it was it was a little chilly that day. Yeah. Hey the Al, send me send me that that electronic, and I'll I'll um. I'll, I'll send it out to every member because maybe everybody wouldn't write it down correctly. Okay. It'll be a reminder yeah. for them. That's very kind of you. Thank you. I no, appreciate that, it. That's what Rotary does. You're a good guy. One, one other question now, um, after you shut down the two Catholic schools, were you excommunicated or anything like that? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> No, I, I, the archdiocese, and I, it's funny because I was just in Philadelphia last weekend for a, um, a family wedding, and a lot of the schools, were, they consolidate a lot of them. That's, I guess it's not like it was in the 60s when there were, I don't know, three or four of them within five, 10 miles of where I lived, so. True. I, I went to two Catholic schools, too, and they're both today. The churches are still in operation, but the schools are not. Yeah, yeah. Anybody have any other questions for Al? I have a quick comment for you, Al. Uh, yes. As you were sharing your bio, I was thinking about how well it paralleled my story. Going back to the IBM Selectric and the big uh, IBM computers and the I worked in Wildwood, New Jersey when I was out of college, <laughs> college. <laughs> and in the technology industry and the digital information and, and, and microfilming and imaging and all of that stuff. You know, <laughs> we had to get together for lunch so we could sit down and talk because this is like, oh, awesome. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I remember a lot of those days myself. I got into IT in 85, so it was before the internet uh, before Al, Al Gore invented the internet and, <laughs> but still there was a lot of interaction beginning across the network um, on DOS screens basically so you you could create email servers but everything was basically a black screen with white typing um, there was no images or anything like that but it was an interesting time to get in because that was like right at the ground floor of Yep. of uh, every of technology just booming so all right any other uh, comments or questions for al 
I really Anything? enjoyed his way of telling his story. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Thank so, you. Well, yeah, I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Me too. Thank you. Um, okay, anything for the good of Rotary by anybody? All right. Well, if if not, then uh, Bill, we got one more thing to do. For the things we think, do, and say, um, Rotary four-way test number one: Is it the truth? Two. Three. And do we still have Stan with us? I'm still here. Well, what do you think, we'll, Stan? We got one I, more thing to say. We'll, we will have some fun. There I'm we go. Right. Okay, everybody, enjoy your uh, day today. It's a beautiful day. Get outside if you can, and we will see you next week. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.